the periodic table. Now that we know from the first couple units where, or approximately where, to find the parts of the atoms, we can start to figure out how these all come together to affect how we view the elements. So the picture over here, you can see the little red dot right in the middle. That's the nucleus. And these black shadings here show the probability of finding electrons. So where it's darker, there's more of a chance of finding electrons there. And when it's lighter, it's less probable to find electrons out there, although it is still probable. We can look at these atoms as individual, yet interacting chemicals, and we're able to group them, not only in the properties they show us when they're by themselves, but also the properties they show when exposed to other elements or compounds. The periodic table of the elements contains both physical and chemical information about every element of matter that can be made in the universe. And that's quite the claim. However, here's one piece of evidence that shows we're probably onto something. This beautiful picture here is part of the Eagle Nebula and it's called the Pillars of Creation. You can kind of see how we've got these straight lines going up looking like pillars. It's a cloud of interstellar gases 7,000 light years from Earth, which is pretty far away, and it's made up mostly of hydrogen, just like we have in our sun, just like we have here on Earth. What's really cool about this picture is NASA captured the image with their telescopes, the Hubble telescope for one. However, we don't think they exist anymore because the light we got from that configuration there implied that it was about to get run over by a supernova. And the light actually got here first before the wave from the supernova that was destroying it got to it. So this probably isn't even there, but we will be able to see it for another thousand years before we see the destruction of it. Why is one of the most useful tools ever created by humans called the periodic table? When scientists started organizing the known elements in the 1800s, they noticed that certain patterns of chemical and physical behavior kept repeating themselves. A pattern, for example. Over here, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all shiny metals and react very violently in water. They explode. There's a picture of it right there. These elements, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, are all very stable gases. And here, these are little vacuum tubes here where you have a little bit of the gas in there and they pass an electric charge through it, an electric field, and they light up. These patterns were so predictable that Dmitry Mendeleev, the scientist who formulated the periodic law, was actually able to predict, and this is the essence of science, to come up with a theory and predict something. He predicted elements 31 and 32 and their approximate masses before they were discovered. He based this all on the patterns of known elements. And here they are, gallium-31 and germanium-32. What's really amazing is his work preceded the discovery of subatomic particles. He knew nothing about electrons, protons, or neutrons. Here's a sample of Mendeleev's first periodic table from March in 1869. Notice right here. He figured out there had to be two elements here, which later turned out to be gallium and germanium. And you can see how he's trying to organize things in, in columns here that had common values. Mendeleev, here's a picture of him on a postage stamp, proposed that elemental properties are periodic functions of their atomic weights. And he ordered the elements by their weight. This ordering failed for a few elements, but Henry Moseley fixed the problem by ordering the table by atomic number. Element properties are periodic functions of their atomic number. So atoms are listed on the periodic table in rows based on their number of protons, which of course is the atomic number. The periodic table is made up of rows and columns. The rows, which go this way, horizontal, are called periods, and the columns are called groups. Groups are sometimes referred to as families, but groups is more commonly used. Here is the full periodic table, and you have the groups, which go down in this direction. Okay, so this here is group 16, this is group 17, and going crosswise, you have periods 1, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. And down here, we'll talk more about these later. This section actually fits in there. And this section, the actinides, actually fit here in the double asterisks. More about that later. Let's get started at looking at the groups of elements. But before we do, you might want to click on this website down here and enjoy a song about the elements. Some groups have distinctive properties and are given special names. And recall, please, from the previous slide, right, the groups go down this way. Group 1, which is over here, are called the alkali metals. They are very reactive. And it starts with lithium over here, goes all the way down here to francium. Group 2 contains the alkaline earth metals. They are reactive, but not as reactive as group 1, which was hydrogen, lithium, etc. Here we have beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. Groups 3 through 12, outlined in red, are the transition metals. They have a low reactivity, and as per the title, they are metals. Group 3 contains the inner transition metals. And these look a little unusual, right? You have these two spaces over here. And see the two rows here? It starts with lanthanium and actinium. They just fit right here. And we'll show you later what that looks like on a full periodic table. So those are the inner transition metals, the lanthanide series and the actinide series. Group 16 is the oxygen family, so named for oxygen right here at the top, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, polonium, and livimorium. And it starts with oxygen at the top. Group 17 are the halogens. They are highly reactive and they are nonmetals. And they start here with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, and unaseptium. Hard to pronounce that one. So it starts with fluorine here. Group 18 are the noble gases. They are nearly inert. They don't react very well at all with other people, other elements. You have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, and then another one here at the bottom. We'll be discussing the main group elements first. The elements outlined in red are members of the main group. They consist of groups 1 and 2, and then 13 through 18.